The fighting in the streets of Saigon during the New Year or Tet Offensive made the war too real. Tonight I have ordered our aircraft and our naval vessels to make no attacks on North Vietnam. It's 1968, a pretty tumultuous year. Head wrapped in a combat bandage being helped across the road now. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio-equipped car. America's chief negotiator is certainly not optimistic. They're about 100 feet from me. There one, two more, two more wounded. Three, four. But there was one event in 1968 that didn't make the headlines, even though it's still having a huge effect on your well-being. I had a wait, 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 and I really got a little bit aggravated because I knew I had the money there, so all I had to do was, you know, cash a check and get out of there. This is Don Wetzel. He's recalling a fateful day in November of that year when he was trying to do something simple. He just wanted to withdraw some cash at his bank. I was scheduled to take a trip uh, on a Monday morning, or so on Friday, on the lunch hour, I went to my bank to get some money. I would say maybe eight to ten people in line. My guess is, you know, maybe I was in that line for like 18 to 20 minutes just to cash a check. Don's time was really valuable. He was a talented engineer and vice president of a technology company that was on the hunt for a new business. But instead of problem solving at his desk at work, he was stuck in a bank lobby. So my job was to come up with one or more new products, and I was getting nowhere. Half a century later, we still share Don's misery. We're stuck in lines all the time. When we wait for coffee in a cafe, when we stand on a crowded train platform, when we get stuck for hours in airport security, we know exactly what he was feeling, watching time slip through his fingers. My brother Aaron wrote a book called How Many Licks. Hey. Hey, Santos, how's it going? Or how to estimate damn near anything. I asked him to calculate for us how much time we're likely to spend waiting in line over our entire lifetimes. Yes, so I think the the number we came up with was 7,000 hours. 7,000 hours waiting in line. That's more than six months of our life stuck in some queue. That's crazy, right? With 7,000 hours, you could take a massive vacation. You could learn a new instrument or a new language or a new sport. But you're not doing any of that. You're just waiting staring at the back of someone's head. And it sucks. We tell ourselves that standing in line is an awful, annoying, happiness-draining waste of time. But what if we could see that line, not as a huge pain in the butt, but as an opportunity to be happier? Our minds are constantly telling us what to do to be happy. But what if our minds are wrong? What if our minds are lying to us, leading us away from what will really make us happy? The good news is that understanding the science of the mind can point us all back in the right direction. You're listening to The Happiness Lab with me, Dr. Laurie Santos. Hey, Don. Hi, Laurie. Great to meet you. Don Wetzel doesn't have the same name recognition as Thomas Edison or Steve Jobs, but he's an inventor too. And it turns out, his irritation with waiting in line led to a creation that revolutionized the financial sector. It has also completely changed the daily routines of ordinary people around the world. Before I met Don, I had a certain image of him in my mind. I rang the doorbell expecting to meet a slick, self-important inventor guy. But then, 90-year-old Don welcomed me into the cozy Dallas home that he shares with his wife, Eleanor. And I realized Don wasn't the Elon Musk type I had imagined. Well, I'm delighted you're here. Thank you so much. Don was like the friendliest grandpa you've ever met. I sat with Don and Eleanor in their living room, which was filled with comfy pillows, smiling photos of their 12 children, and clocks. Lots of clocks. They were lovely, but clocks are kind of the nemesis of the podcaster. I'm going to wait till this stops in a second, and then I'll finish up. I can stop that. No, no, that's okay. The clocks are kind of fitting, though, because Don understands the value of time. In fact, it was that feeling of wasted time back in 1968 that led to his life-changing idea. So while I was in line, uh, I thought, seems to me a teller's job mostly is cashing checks and taking deposits. So I just got the idea that, hmm, I think a machine could do that. 
That's right. Don had just dreamed up the ATM, the automated teller machine that millions upon millions of busy people use every day. Nowadays, the idea of an ATM seems really obvious. But Don faced a lot of resistance when he first pitched the idea. On the board of our, our company, there was a banker. He thought it was the dumbest idea he had ever heard. He said, we have tellers to do that. Has anybody told you that yet? You know, we do have tellers that do exactly what you're saying your machine could do. So why do you think anybody would buy this? That board member wasn't entirely crazy. There had been earlier attempts at automated bank machines, and they'd all failed, including one that took deposits. Its inventor, Luther Simjian, lamented, the only people using the machine were prostitutes and gamblers who didn't want to deal with a teller face to face. The genius of Don's ATM is that it won the trust of millions of regular customers who loved its convenience. You know, everybody prefers to get things done quicker. And, you know, the ATM was a quick and easy way. Anybody could use an ATM, really, because it's very simple. Stick the card in, key in your PIN number, and bingo, here comes the money, if you got it in the bank, of course. But now, in hindsight, can you see that this started, you know, uh, in some ways, a revolution of convenience? Well, I never thought of it that way, really, Laurie. Uh, now, I'll tell you a story about that. You know, I had to come up with a forecast as to how many of these ATMs we were going to sell. And I felt like we could sell 4,000 of these machines. <laughs> I think there might have been 4,000 just in the, ba- in the airport where I was just <laughs> at DFW today. Well, at the latest report that I heard... Uh, throughout the world, there's, uh, they estimated there was 1.3 million ATMs uh, installed nowadays. But the real success of the ATM, according to Don, is that it improves people's well-being. It gets them out of those annoying lines. It just made sense that nobody wanted to wait in the teller line like I did. So it makes every bank customer happy to get in and get out and do some other things. A bit more free time is something we all need. And Don's simple idea has probably freed up millions, possibly billions of hours the world over. But it turns out, there's an awful downside to all this convenience and save time. One that our lying minds don't even realize. Don Wetzel's intuition was that most people want a bit of extra free time, that it'll make us happier. And the science backs him up. Simply put, we all feel way too busy. Today, many of us experience what scientists call time famine. We're literally starving for time. And that famished feeling has a negative effect on our well-being. In fact, people who report feeling short on time are more likely to be depressed, anxious, and less happy than people who feel like they have lots of free time. Psychologists have even come up with a term for that amazing feeling you get when, say, a meeting is canceled and you suddenly have a free hour you didn't expect. We call it time affluence. And those rare moments when we feel wealthy in time can make us feel amazing. It's one of the reasons that every once in a while, I sometimes surprise my Yale students by canceling my happiness class. And their reactions show just how important a little unexpected time off can be. One student even burst into tears. She said it was the first time she'd had an hour off all semester. She'd almost forgotten what it was like to have some free time. So adding even a few extra minutes to our perceived time banks can feel really good. But recent studies also suggest something rather counterintuitive. That is, we misestimate just how busy we really are. While there's lots of work showing that we feel busier than ever before, there's very little evidence showing that we actually are busier, which is kind of weird. It's as though our minds tell us we're super busy all the time, but in reality, it's not as bad as we think. But there's another even more insidious way our mind leads us astray when we try to save some time. It turns out there's an opportunity cost that comes from avoiding those bank lines, and the cost is a social one. Long lines are frustrating, but they're also an opportunity to be around other people. And the sheer amount of time we spend around other people actually predicts how happy we are. Take one famous study by positive psychologists Ed Diener and Marty Seligman. They looked at people who scored in the highest 10th percentile on happiness surveys and tried to figure out what makes them so much happier than the rest of us. The researchers discovered that these happy people didn't spend any more time exercising or doing religious activities. What did these happy folks do differently? They were more social. 
they spent more time around other humans than people with average levels of happiness. The results were so strong that these researchers deemed being around other people as a necessary condition for very high happiness. Another study by Nobel Prize winning psychologist Danny Kahneman confirmed this. He and his colleagues tested which daily activities make us feel best. The winner? Socializing with others. It's better than eating, shopping, relaxing, or even watching TV. Just being with other people makes us feel good, even if those people are strangers. There are lots of sources of well-being standing around you. You just have to tap into them. My friend Nick Epley is a professor of behavioral science at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Happiness isn't about the intensity of experiences that we have. It's about the frequency of them. Happiness is like a, is like a, you know, a leaky tire on your car. You don't have a nice conversation with somebody and then are happy forever. But if you're having a nice conversation with somebody on a plane, that plane ride is more enjoyable than it would have been otherwise. But then, you know, once you're off the plane ride, you know, your tire goes flat a little bit. You got to do something else to pump it back up. And so I find a lot of these conversations are like, are like, uh, you know, air compressors for my, for my tires. Nick studies why we're so resistant to being more social. Why don't we take more time to fill up our leaky happiness tires with a quick conversation? People get the consequences of social interaction wrong particularly with strangers. Not engaging in conversation with somebody else gives you a cost somewhere else. And people don't always seem to recognize that. It turns out the cost of not being social, not taking enough time to connect with other people, is that it makes us feel pretty awful. Feeling lonely or isolated just kind of stinks. Loneliness is now a growing epidemic around the world. People today report feeling lonely at double the rate they did in the 1980s. Take college campuses, like where I work, at Yale. Nationally in the U.S. right now, over 60% of college students report feeling very lonely most of the time. This is higher than in any other previous generation. A stressor like that impairs your well-being and it impairs your health. Recent research shows that the physical consequences of our increased loneliness are staggering. Feeling isolated is said to be as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. If loneliness had a health warning, it would sound like this. May cause increased risk of inflammation, disrupted sleep, abnormal immune responses, depression, anxiety, higher stress levels, early cognitive decline, alcoholism, cardiovascular disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, suicide, and even early death. So what can we do to fight this loneliness epidemic? Well, you can get a few hints from people who don't feel all that lonely. People like Eleanor Wetzel. I'm half extrovert and half introvert. Mm -hmm. And so that part of my personality enjoys the connection with people. From the moment Don Wetzel's wife welcomed me into her home, it was obvious that this old-fashioned grandmother was the opposite of lonely. She was one of the most sociable people I had met in a while. She had a story for everything, including how she met Don. It was a blind date, so we were starting at zero. And I, I think there was just a chemistry there. I had planned to spend only 30 minutes or so on this interview, but I ended up chatting with Eleanor for over two hours. We talked about our families, what her life was like growing up, how she was able to raise so many children, and other stuff too. I asked what her secret was. How did she connect with people so easily? It turns out she just chats with strangers whenever she can. I have no problem with direct eye contact and smiles. You know, that's... That's who we are. That's how you relate to people. But I can see a lot of downers with the technology that we have available. The ATM doesn't smile back at you or, mm -hmm. or show me their pretty eyes or whatever. So we don't want to lose all of that. It's true that Don's ATMs have given us back time, but they've also robbed us of an important opportunity to connect with human tellers and our fellow bank customers. They steal one of the small chances we have each day to fill up our leaky happiness tires with a quick conversation. Which is why Eleanor has taken a relatively shocking stance on ATMs. Well, I've actually never used one, period. That's right. Eleanor has never used an ATM, even though her husband is the guy that invented them. She just prefers to chat with the teller. 
I don't think we even know yet how much is being lost without that interaction of human beings. The whole bit, there's just so, there's so many components, I, I wouldn't even have time to go into all of them, and I'm sure I haven't even thought of all of them. Eleanor's right here. We're automating the humans out of everything. Take music, for example. Back in 1968, if Eleanor wanted to hear a new song, she'd have to interact with a bunch of people. She'd have to find a record store, ask the clerk where to find that new song, stand in line with other folks to buy it, and only then could she drive home with her kids to throw it on her record player. But today, it's different. Who is this Alexa that you can have do everything for you? Every new automated convenience we introduce into our lives has a cost. And that cost, all too often, is a social one. The problem is, it's not often a cost we even realize. The question is why? But first, we need some music to send us into the break. So let's tease what's coming up next. Alexa, play anything by the talking heads. I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Give me a moment. The Happiness Lab will be right back. I ride the train into Chicago every day um, to my office in Hyde Park from one of the far south side suburbs. And every day I get on the train and I was seeing exactly the same kind of phenomena. I'd seen it for years. Science begins with observation. And Nick Epley observes something on his daily commute that is so commonplace, yet so odd when you really think about it. Where people would get on, sit down next to their neighbors, um, perfectly decent, lovely people going into Chicago to work for the day. They would sit down cheek to jowl next to somebody else, and they would then ignore each other for 45 minutes. Most train cars are full of people, which means they're also full of knowledge, stories, and jokes. But most are also deathly quiet. I mean, almost nobody ever talks on the train. The question is why. Nick decided to test this. He recruited passengers sharing his commute to work, dividing them into three different groups, or conditions as we researchers call them. He asked each group to act in a certain way while they were on the train. The one condition we told them to keep to themselves, just focus on their day ahead, don't engage others around you in conversation this morning. Uh, The second condition, we asked them to do whatever they normally do, which is typically the same as what happens in the solitude condition. Almost nobody talks to strangers on the train. Um, And in the third condition, we asked them to do something radical. We asked them to try to make a connection uh, with the person who sits down next to you this morning on the train, try to get to know something about him or her. So they were going to have a conversation. Let's think about these different groups for a second. Which one would you be happiest in? The groups in which you could enjoy your solitude, or the one that forced you to talk to a complete stranger? You might naturally have a pretty strong intuition here, but I bet that intuition is wrong. People reported the most positive commute in the connection condition, less positive in the control condition, and least positive in the solitude condition where they kept to themselves. Being forced to talk with a stranger was far and away the most pleasurable experience. Simply making a connection with someone we don't know makes us feel really good. Nick's now done this very same study in a number of different contexts, on city buses, in cabs at the airport, in waiting rooms. They all find the same result. People are happiest when they're being social with someone. But what about that other person? You could imagine that we were potentially spreading misery, that the person who was talked to maybe was was unhappy about this. We were like polluting the train with all of this unwanted conversation. So does your conversation make other people miserable? Well, Nick tested that too, by creating a fake waiting room in his laboratory. They were also happier when they were talked to than when they um, uh, were not talked to. And that effect was just as big as the effect on the people who were instructed to talk. So I didn't, I don't think we're spreading misery on the trains or the buses. Connecting with someone is pleasant, whether you are the one who's initiating it or the one you're, you're receiving it. Note that Nick's not advocating harassing someone on the train or continuing to try to talk to someone who clearly doesn't want you to speak to them. All Nick's saying is that a quick conversation can make us feel good. The problem is, That's not what we think is going to happen. 
When Nick asked people to imagine how they'd feel getting into a conversation with a stranger, they wrongly predicted that it wouldn't be fun or uplifting. The reason that's interesting is because our expectations guide our behavior. So if you expect it's going to be freezing cold outside, you'll pick up a jacket and you'll wear it when you go outside. If you expect that it's going to be really warm outside, you won't wear a jacket. If I expect that talking to somebody will be pleasant, I'll do it. If I expect it'll be miserable, I won't. But I bet you're thinking, what if you're shy around people? Maybe all this talking to strangers stuff works if you're really outgoing, but maybe it sucks for introverts. And we did measure this, we, and we found actually no difference at all between introverts and extroverts in, in across these conditions. That is, introverts enjoyed connecting with others as extroverts did. Um, introverts did not enjoy keeping to themselves in, in solitude, and extroverts didn't enjoy that either. What tends to vary are people's expectations about how they're going to feel. So an introvert, because they think they're not going to enjoy a party, is going to choose not to go. Whereas an extrovert who enjoys a party might choose to go. On average, people tend to feel happier when they're connecting with others, and that's true for both extroverts and introverts. Nick's results are quite challenging for a lot of people to hear. No matter what your personality type is, you will increase your happiness if you interact with people you randomly meet in stores or on public transport. Creates a social connection. It keeps you connected on the right level. I made this very point on the CBS Morning News recently. Happy people take time for social connection. They try to make connections with the people on the street. And I got some interesting reactions from the viewers. Here's one tweet um, from someone who says, quote, talk to a stranger on the bus. Are you insane? Don't talk to strangers. It's dangerous. Didn't your mama teach you anything? Um, here's another one, uh, one of my personal <laughs> favorites. Uh, if, a t- if, if a stranger talks to me on a bus, I will go nuts. People die because of shite like this. Hell no. Um, uh-huh. So, so do, you get, do you get similar reactions where people hear these data and are just like, not true, not me? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get it uh, all the time. I get a lot of pushback on this because the expectations are so strong. So what people are imagining, I think, are random people who might come up to you and talk to you. And they imagine sort of the worst case outcome. Um, so they're imagining homeless people or uh, you know, mentally ill people or something who, who, who are dangerous to them or psychopaths, whatever. Um, but that's a different situation from what we're asking people to do here. We're just asking you to talk to a person who happens to be sitting next to you. And the person who happens to be sitting next to you is likely to just be a normal person, um, not a psychopath. We don't do something that's almost certain to make us happier because we think we'll be preyed upon by some imaginary psycho killer. Actually, we're going into the break again. Alexa, play Psycho Killer by the talking... I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. That's so annoying. I'm so sorry. The show will be back in a moment. Nick Epley thinks we're too scared of falling victim to some psycho killer to strike up conversations on a train. Such unfounded fears are part of why we seem to find the automation revolution so alluring. Don's ATM was the first step, but now we're killing the human part of so many of our interactions. I want to introduce you to someone who's deeply worried about this new direction. Someone who is making changes in his own life to fight back. David Byrne. We're losing something and a lot of the efficiency that we think is there is kind of an illusion. This is insane. You probably know David as a Talking Heads frontman. But what you may not know is that David also writes brilliant social essays. He recently authored a fantastic article for the MIT Technology Review on the hidden dangers of automation. Its title, Eliminating the Human. If these things are becoming so ubiquitous, the elimination of the human interaction, what does that mean for us as individuals, as a society, as a community. David's thesis is that humans have developed over millions of years to work, trade, have fun, and form relationships face-to-face. You're getting all these different signals. You're getting signals from their body language, their facial expression, what their eyes are doing, the tone of their voice. We are social animals. That's 
what we are. We're like ants and wolves, and we are an animal that flourishes because we are social. And you wonder what will happen or what is happening when that aspect of our deep makeup starts to be taken away from us, or not so much taken away, we give it up voluntarily. David's worried that we're all voluntarily turning our backs on our fellow humans every day thanks to new products which promise us ease and convenience be it an ATM or an app to pre-order our groceries or a film streaming service that saves us a trip to a crowded movie theater. I'm not saying that whoever designed these things had in the front of their mind, can I come up with a technology to eliminate some of the human interaction in my life? But it sure seems to be the result. No disrespect to inventors like Don Wetzel, who is as social as social can be. But David worries that a relatively small section of society, namely the engineers who design all this stuff, they're creating a world that the rest of us must inhabit, and they are creating it in their own image. My father was an engineer. I enjoy that, that mindset of uh, looking at things from an engineer's point of view. But I recognize a lot of that in a lot of uh, programmers, coders, engineers, who are designing a lot of the things that kind of envelop us in the contemporary world. You can sense that a lot of these guys, and most of them are guys, uh, are not comfortable in social situations. So even if they would not vocally say, I want to make a world where I never have to interact with a person, they might unconsciously do that. That's the world that has been made for us. And uh, whether we want to or not, we're living in their world. Whether or not you completely buy the stereotype that all engineers shun human company, most of us can admit that what they've designed is often pretty tempting. Many of us have moments where we relish opportunities to be by ourselves or just hide away a bit. When I was much younger, I was much shyer. Uh, I was much much, much more uncomfortable in social situations. I would create a kind of facade or character or persona that would be my face for a social interaction, and it was a little bit artificial. In that sense, I can identify and understand that a lot of people feel like, oh, no, if I can figure out a way to navigate the world with as few annoying interactions with the human, then very good. Let's design interfaces that uh, speed things along and help uh, someone who is uncomfortable in social situations, for example, get through them without the pesky human. At the end of his MIT Tech Review article, David argues that as we spend less and less time talking and listening to each other, we'll become less tolerant of each other's differences will become more inclined to envy and antagonism. It's a chilling prospect. But can science save us? Can researchers like Nick convince the champions of automation that they're getting the balance between convenience and happiness all wrong? I'm afraid to say, it doesn't look promising. Remember Nick's experiment using train passengers? How he found that the people he forced into conversation with their fellow commuters had happier journeys? Well, Nick reported these findings back to the head of marketing at the railroad company. And here was her response. Nick, you're not going to believe what we're about to do. She said, we're going to roll out a new policy on the trains. We're going to put in place a quiet car. I said, oh, really? Uh, and the, the quiet car is one, she explained, where people are not allowed to engage in conversation. They're not allowed to talk on their cell phones. They're not allowed to talk to somebody sitting next to them. It's supposed to be absolutely quiet. Nick was surprised why the train company had made a decision that completely contradicted his well-being research. And she said, well, because we asked people on a survey what they wanted, and this is what they said they wanted. <laughs> Which, of course, I pointed out to her, is exactly what our participants said they wanted, too. And it just turned out not quite to be right, at least in terms of their well-being. Nick, being a good scientist, wanted to know if the railroad people had carried out an experiment with the opposite of a quiet car. Have you ever just put a chatty car on the line 
where people can just get together, you know, maybe you got snacks or something and you can get together and you just talk. You just, you know, get to know your neighbors a little bit, get to know your commuters, your, your chatty car. And she laughed and she said, no, we've, we've never done the chatty car, but we used to have bar cars on the trains where, where people would get together and often they would then connect with each other there. And I, and I asked her, do you still have the bar cars anymore? She said, no, we don't, we don't have them anymore. And I asked, why not? I was imagining you know, her telling stories about people stumbling off the trains drunk or something, but she said the real problem was they were too crowded. <laughs> that is, they were too popular. So there were too many people who wanted to be in there. That's the point at which, as a behavioral scientist, you just sort of sigh and you <laughs> think. It clearly seems they have clear data that people really enjoy being able to connect with each other, and yet that service doesn't doesn't get extended. So they canceled it because the chatty car or the equivalent of it was uh, was too crowded. So if banks and railroad companies and app designers and store owners aren't going to come to our rescue, what are we to do to stop feeling so isolated? The answer is pretty simple. We just need to connect with other people and not just our friends and family members. We also need to make the effort to connect more with strangers the random people around us in lines and on our commute. They matter more than we think. David Byrne realized this. Despite his natural shyness, he's trying to be part of the cure. He now embraces opportunities to connect with the people who cross his path. Yeah, it happened the other day. The subways were messed up and uh, there was a, a Chinese guy who was really having a hard, he had some luggage with him and he was really having a hard time. Everything, all of, everything has changed. You know, this train's now on this line, this train's now running on this line. This used to be an express, now it's a local. And it was all this, so we kind of figured it out together, um, which was kind of sweet. You have made a connection and what I discover is very often they'll smile that you are sharing this Acknowledgement with them, they might laugh, you'll laugh. And, and so it kind of, well, it sounds like a cliche, but it brightens your day for another 15 minutes at least. So what have we learned in this episode? For one thing, we too readily assume that convenience, efficiency, and near instant gratification are the roots to happiness. But that assumption is often wrong. Tiny human interactions are the burst of air we need for our happiness tires to steal Nick's metaphor. Your mind might tell you a quick conversation is going to be awkward. Too much time, not worth it. But those intuitions are wrong, even for shy folks. So get out there and make a new connection. Next time you are standing in line, talk to the person next to you. If you can't think of something to say, you could tell them that lines are an opportunity and that the guy who had the inspiration for the ATM machine did so while waiting in a bank line and that his wife has never used that invention. You could even tell them that you heard that on a podcast, a podcast called The Happiness Lab with Dr. Laurie Santos. If you enjoyed the show, I'd be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and a review. It really does help other listeners find us. And don't forget to tell your friends. If you want to learn more about the science you heard on the show, then check out our website, happinesslab.fm. You can also sign up for our newsletter to get exclusive content. The Happiness Lab is co-written and produced by Ryan Dilley. The show is mixed and mastered by Evan Viola and edited by Julia Barton. Fact-checking by Joseph Fridman. And our original music was composed by Zachary Silver. Special thanks to Mia LaBelle, Carly Migliori, Heather Fain, Maggie Taylor, Maya Koenig, and Jacob Weisberg. The Happiness Lab is brought to you by Pushkin Industries and me, Dr. Laurie Santos. 